So welcome back. Uh, it's great to see you again. And this is the third talk that I'm going to be giving on living with lockdown or living under lockdown. We looked yesterday at learning through pain, looking at Philippians and Paul's experience um, with the Church of Philippi in Acts. And then we looked at the churches of Ephesus and Colossae and um, reflecting on some of Paul's um, thinking around leading through others. So today we're going to be focusing uh, not on the third journey now, but the fourth journey and actually Paul's final journey uh, to Rome. We're going to be looking at the book of 2 Timothy and um, where we look at lockdown in, at the end of Acts 28, where Paul ends up in, uh, under house arrest in uh, Rome on his second trip to Rome, he is actually under arrest in a cell. And so his world has got even smaller. And so the title of this talk is Legacy Through Limitation. So as we begin this talk, let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for uh, today. Thank you for the things that you have for us. Thank you for the things you want to teach us. Thank you for the things that you want us to lean into and to grow in ourselves, to stir in ourselves. We pray today that you would fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit. You would bring the word of God to life and you'd help us to reflect on what these words mean to us today. We pray this for your glory, for your kingdom, for your church. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, um, Paul always intended to go to Rome. You know, I love the way at the beginning of Romans, we see that um, Paul, uh, this is before he's visited the city and before he's visited the church. He says um, in uh, chapter one, verse 14, I am bound both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are at Rome. And um, he, uh, you know, he wants to go there, I think, because it's the center of the Roman world. It's, um, you know, all roads lead to Rome. And of course, actually, if you are in Rome, all, leads, all roads lead away from Rome. So in terms of a, a place to have an impact, it's a hugely important, significant place in, um, in, that, uh, in that time, but also in the workings of what God wants to do. It's it kind of it's burning within Paul. And, you know, we know that he wanted to, be, to go to significant strategic places like Ephesus, like some of the cities he went to on the second journey. But this is really where his sights are, the set on Rome. And of course, um, at, at the end of Acts, we read the story of um, how he ends up in Rome. I'm going to read a few verses to you of how that happened. So this is Acts chapter 28. Um, he's just left Malta. And um, after three months, we put out to sea in a ship that had wintered in the island. It was an Alexandrian ship with the figurehead of the twin gods Castor and Pollux. We put in at Syracuse and stayed there three days. From there, we set sail and arrived at um, Regium. The next day, the south winds came up and on the following day, we um, reached Puteoli. There we found some brothers who invited us to spend a week with them. And so we came to Rome. The brothers there had heard that we were coming and they traveled as far as the Forum of Appius and the three taverns to meet us. I love some of the detail that Luke puts in there. At the sight of these men, Paul thanked God and was encouraged. When we got to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. Three days later, he called together the leaders of the Jews. He's, he's always done this, but this time, rather than going to the synagogue, he's asking them to come to him. When they had assembled, Paul said to them, my brothers, although I've done nothing against our people or against the customs of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and had handed over to the Romans. They examined me and wanted to release me because I was not guilty of any crime deserving death. But when the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, not that I had any charge to bring against my own people. For this reason, I have asked to see you and talk with you. It is because of the hope of Israel that I am bound with this chain. 
He's under house arrest, he's got a soldier next to him. He's preaching the gospel to the Jews who live in that city. And um, they replied, we've not received any letters from Judea concerning you. And none of the brothers who have come from there have reported or said anything bad about you. But we want to hear what your views are, for we know that people everywhere are talking against this sect. They arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. From morning till evening, he explained and declared to them the kingdom of God and tried to convince them about Jesus from the law of Moses and from the prophets. Some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. They disagreed among themselves and began to leave after Paul had made this final statement. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your forefathers when he said to them through the Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, You will be ever hearing but never understanding. You will be ever seeing but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn and I would heal them. Therefore I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles and they will listen. For two whole years Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. Boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, um, in the capital of the Roman Empire, the gospel's influence would influence and impact the whole Roman world. Paul does not shy away from preaching, even in lockdown. He's had people coming to see him rather than him going out and about. And he's able to, um, to um, persuade people who are even, you know, they're, 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 they're not very happy about this sect of Christianity. And uh, they still come and hear what he has to say. And he persuades them and he, he um, talks to them about the kingdom of God. But he also says, this is not just for you Jews, this is for Gentiles as well. And he opens the door to enable Gentiles to hear the gospel. He did this for two years under house arrest. He seizes that moment. He seizes a lockdown situation where he, he's not even allowed to go out on exercise. Um, he has to stay put and he's actually chained to a soldier. So that soldier would have heard a lot of gospel teaching himself. And so we, um, we see here Paul's evangelism. But what we also get is um, actually a sense of Paul um, from other places in scripture, Paul spending a lot of time with leaders who he is investing in. So what are we seeing? What is the impact of Paul not giving up? Well, we see um, some of the things here. We see an appeal to Caesar. Remember, he appealed to Caesar when he felt that all avenues were closed. This is the way he knew he needed to get to Rome. And so he says, I appeal to Caesar. And he had the right as a Roman citizen to be judged in front of him. And so um, in that appeal, he brought um, his message to key people, um, to prefects, to regional kings back in Israel. And eventually he even preaches to the emperor of the known world, to Nero himself. Paul plants a church, um, the first church on Malta, um, he didn't even know that that island existed and he hadn't planned on starting a church there, but he starts a church there. Um, and you know, that church probably reached the whole island. Um, then Paul's reputation attracted large numbers of people to come and hear his message in Rome. And, um, you know, there's room for his large team in Rome. We already know. Do you remember those letters to Philippians and to Colossians and to Ephesians? If you just look at the beginning of those letters, you can see who they're written by. Um, it's not just um, Paul, but it's also Silas. It's also others. Um, so Colossians, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. He's writing with other leaders these letters to these, um, to these churches round and about. Um, Paul's arrest enables him to write four epistles, Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, and Philemon. Um, we're still learning from this apostle who preached the good news to the Gentile world today. That was the impact of you know, what he did as he wrote these letters. Um, when you lock up or kill a church leader, the church prospers. Just think about the church in China. When the, um, the missionaries were expelled from China, um, when uh, the Maoist revolution took place. And um, the church was praying, but they thought, oh no, you know, all of our work's gone to ruin. You know, what's gonna happen people? Um, what's gonna happen to the churches that were established? And they, uh, they mourned the loss of the church. 
and yet um, when the borders opened up again and we hear about the underground church, the, the church has just multiplied and, and multiplied and multiplied and it's had such a huge impact on the whole nation. So in lockdown, under arrest, where people are persecuted and, and driven to underground, actually the gospel still spreads and has an impact on the world around them. Paul's um, imprisonment in Rome released others to take up his mission. And there's kind of, again, a release of leaders and developed leaders who go all over the place. He has access to his guards in prison, um, people who are supposed to be watching over him. He is able not just to preach the gospel to them, but he's able to use them even as an illustration as he's writing to the Ephesians about the armour of God. He's just looking at this living illustration in front of him and saying, you know, this is what we need. We need what this Roman soldier is wearing. We need it spiritually for ourselves. And Paul is always mentoring new leaders. From this place of lockdown, he is, having, um, he is sending leaders out, spending time with them, then sending them out to reproduce all that he's done through his ministry and multiply his influence around the world. So um, in this place of lockdown, we read about these people, Epaphroditus, Timothy, Luke, Mark, Demas, Aristarchus, Jesus called Justice, um, Epaphras, Tychicus, um, Onesimus. They are all mentioned and there are probably more, including soldiers. These are disciples who would have gone um, from the roads, fanning out from Rome, and um, to do what Paul had done on previous journeys. They would have been taught the lessons that Paul had about multiplication, about disciple making, about apprenticing leaders, about planting churches yourself and planting churches through church plants that plant other churches that plant other churches, reaching whole regions with the gospel. So that the impact of him being locked in one building, one house, is influencing the whole world by sending out leaders who have learnt his lessons and, and promoting that himself. I think, um, you know, that is uh, why Paul is able to say in 2, 2 Timothy um, uh, chapter 4 and verse 17, let's just look at that. We'll spend some time in 2 Timothy um, uh, from now on. But 2 Timothy 4 verse 17. The Lord stood by my side and gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So Paul knew that even in his limitation of being locked by a soldier um, and under house arrest, it had a huge impact and left a huge legacy for the church. Extraordinary what God can do in the most extraordinary circumstances in the way we least expect it. Now, sometime after two years, he's had the chance to preach to Nero um, and Paul is released. Paul goes on to, um, uh, to go to other places um, uh, in the region, probably uh, back to Philippi, um, to Thessalonica. He might have even done a visit to Spain. He was certainly planning to do that, we read in, um, at the end of Romans. Um, and uh, then he ends up in Troas. Again, the port city where he's had that vision, remember, of the Macedonian man years before. And he is probably um, betrayed by uh, a man called Alexander. And we pick up the story um, of that betrayal because he is taken to Rome for a second time. And this time he is locked in a cell. He is alone. He um, has uh, been... Uh, kind of taken away from his comforts. He's, um, he doesn't have um, some key things that he wanted with him and he, he writes to Timothy with some instructions about what to do. And it's in this place of, um, of complete lockdown, of being bound in a cell. These are probably the last few days and last few weeks of his life. So we get a different perspective on this man who's had such an impact on the world. Does he give up? Does he feel sorry for himself? Well, I think there's certainly some um, sadness that comes through the letter of um, to Timothy, but he's in a cold, damp dungeon in Rome. And um, he was um, beheaded in AD 67, just a few weeks later. 
So I guess I want to ask the question as I look at these last few verses in 2 Timothy, what is the increase of your reach that's going to be possible if you intentionally um, give away, if you intentionally um, multiply yourself, if you invest yourself, even when you're limited, what is the legacy you can leave for others? These are profound things. These are mature things. These are deep things for Christian leaders to ponder. Because it's as we give of ourselves, as we give without counting the cost, we begin to see extraordinary fruitfulness in the kingdom of God. This is what Jesus talks about when he says, you know, let that grain of wheat fall to the ground and die, that we see that crop 30, 60, 100 fold produced extraordinary proliferation of impact and ministry. You know, we can do that through leaders, we can do that through influence, influence we can do that through investing um, in others. So let me read the last few verses of 2 Timothy chapter 4. I'm going to pick it up from verse 6. It's just beautiful words. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Timothy, do your best to come to me quickly. For Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark, that's John Mark, get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. So when you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas and my scrolls, especially the parchments. Alexander the metal worker did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he has done. You too should be on your guard against him because he strongly opposed our message. At my first defence, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory for ever and ever. Amen. So you've got this, I think, deeply passionate, heart-rendering, very personal message from Paul to Timothy. He's encouraging him. He's urging him on. He's, he's um, giving this legacy piece of, of helping him to concentrate on what's important. But then he's even saying, you know, can you get me my parchments? Can you get me my cloak? It's deeply personal. It's, he's alone. He's just got Luke with him. Some of the people have deserted him, but others he's sent and, left him, um, that, and that's left him alone. Dear jo Dr. Luke, who is such a friend and supporter and a long -sider in this. What an amazing man and friend he was. So what we see here is, um, is really, you know, what is your legacy? What is the legacy that you want to leave with others? You know, for Paul, he was clear that he wanted to be a success and that he had done what he needed to do. Chapter 4, verse 6. I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. I have fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. Now is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. I think he knows that he has given everything and that he has succeeded in his calling. He's done what God called him to do. Have you done that? Have you, are you doing everything you can right now to make the most of the Lord's day today? We never know when he's going to take us. We never know when our end might come. But with Paul, are we able to say, I've done everything I can. I've thrown myself in. I've been faithful 
and in store for me is that crown of righteousness too. There might be plans, there might be desires. Paul, you know, he wanted to do so many other things, but actually he knows he's done everything he could. You know, someone said that success is finding out what God wants you to do and doing it. Paul finished well. And how you finish is important. How you finish is important. And that decision starts today. It starts right now. You might live for decades. You might live for a few days. But how you deal with this, how you lean into saying, actually, I want to do what you're calling me to do. I want to live each day being faithful to you. I want to lean into your calling for me, the part you've called me to play. I'm going to play that right now and do that with as much energy, with as much life, with as much passion as I can. It's a decision that is a daily decision and that impacts your legacy. It impacts your influence on others. It impacts the way that other people are going to be touched through you. And God wants to do that through you. you know, my mother died five years ago. She, um, she prayed for me. She's a, um, a woman who um, loved the Lord. Uh, she was very involved in ministry and she was particularly involved in training lay leaders. Um, she was what we call a reader in this country and she um, had a national role of um, uh, making sure that reader training all across the nation was um, you know compatible with, it, with each other and that you know the highest best possible standard was achieved for training these lay readers these preachers and um, when uh, she was dying she knew that she was dying and um, she prepared for her death well. She prepared us well. I remember um, a moment where she um, invited our whole family to come and um, spend time with her. And she said, um, uh, I want you to come now. I think I've, I've been told by the docs I've got a week to live. Um, and I want the next week, I, I'm going to be in a lot of pain, so I'm going to make sure I'm drugged up completely so I don't feel any of it. So I won't be compus mentis to be able to speak to you. That's why I want to speak to you now. And so she was ready to die and she prepared us for that and she um, I remember her praying these words over our children she said stay close to Jesus and you will be blessed by him you know these words of impartation to our children have stayed with our children they stayed with me and they've stayed with me because I want to die like that I want to be in that place where I'm ready and I've given something away to my children and those people who I care about, those people who I've invested in. You know, her positive influence has lasted beyond the grave. I, I want to be like that. So Paul's influence lasted beyond the grave. You know, we're reading his words still. He wrote uh, from that um, house arrest, those epistles, this epistle to 2 Timothy, to, um, called 2 Timothy, the second one to Timothy. These extraordinary words that are left for us centuries later and still powerful. And, you know, his legacy, if you're holding a Bible, you're holding that legacy in your own hands. And so as I finish this talk, I want to leave you with these questions. What do you want your legacy to be? Will you choose, even in the midst of lockdown, even in the midst of these limitations that are forced on us, how will you use those limitations, not to restrict you, but to give away and multiply yourself to others? How will you use this time to take the most precious things that God has taught you and given you and reflect on those things and give them away. How can you teach others the faith, the life that God has given to you, that it might be a legacy for others to lean into for themselves? What is your legacy? I want to finish with a prayer um, for you. This is a blessing as I finish this talk. So may the spirit of truth lead you into all truth. 
give you grace to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and strengthen you to proclaim the word and works of God and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you now and always. Amen.